Well, we, we thank you all for coming and we're really excited about this weekend. Hope you're enjoying it so far and getting a chance to catch up with friends and, and also maybe learn a little bit. So I'm Vivian Lee, I'm the Dean of the Medical School, and uh, this is now the beginning of my third year here. And I'm very pleased to give you a bit of an update on things that are happening in the medical school. It can't be comprehensive because there are so many things going on, but I'll just give you a few highlights and then uh, happy to answer questions or, or converse even after, after today if you're interested in knowing more. So this is sort of how I feel right now. I'm one of those little kids, the journey to enlightenment. Are we there yet? <laughs> I think we're making some progress. So here's what I'd like to cover uh, over the next few minutes. Share with you some of the announcements, some of the new recruitments, people that are joining here, the U, and a few people who have announced that they'll be stepping down from positions. Um, talk about the new expanded School of Medicine class size. Some a little bit of a conversation about healthcare reform and how we as an institution are looking to take that on. Innovation here at the U. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit, share with you just some very early thoughts about the medical school building and, um, and the future of that building. So that's what I'm hoping to cover. So since we last met, we've brought some really great new talent to the university. We have two new chairs in the School of Medicine, and I'm thrilled with both of them. So Wendy Chapman obtained her PhD in biomedical informatics right here at the U um, not too long ago, a while ago, and then went to the University of Pittsburgh for most of her career, recently had moved to UC San Diego, and then we were able to recruit her and her husband back here to Utah. She is a nationally recognized informatician. Her expertise is in natural language processing. Sam Finlayson is another star recruit for us. He's the new chair of surgery. Remember that Sean Mulvihill stepped down from that position in order to become the CEO of the faculty practice. And so at that vacancy, we did a na nationwide search. Sam hails to us from Boston. He w did all of his training in Boston through Harvard and the Mass General and then went to Dartmouth where he was a, a <coughs> faculty member, got very involved in health services research, became the vice chair for surgery at Dartmouth. And just two years ago, he was recruited back to Harvard to the Brigham and Women's Hospital by Atul Gawande. Many of you would know uh, that name. And Atul recruited Sam back to be his right-hand man in doing health services research at the Brigham. And that's where we found Sam. So we're delighted to bring him here to Utah. Uh, we did have a little secret weapon, which was that his, um, his eldest child, I think, is at Harvard. His number two just started at BYU this last fall, so that was a real advantage for us, and we, of course, take advantage of any opportunity that we can. So we're really happy to have them join. And then we have two new hires in the health sciences level. Um, many of you know Steve Warner, who has run development for many, many years for us, just a wonderful individual, part of the family. Well, Steve got called on a mission to be a mission president for the LDS Church, of all places, to Hawaii. So we stopped feeling sorry for him just a couple of weeks ago when the snow started here. <laughs> and so we had to really fill those very large shoes. And so Jay Vogelsang will be joining us next Tuesday as the new head of development. And he comes from... Um, he comes from the West, but most recently he's been at the Mayo Clinic. He ran the Mayo Clinic's last... Um, campaign that was a multi-billion dollar campaign. It was a very successful campaign, and so we are thrilled to have him coming. David Browdy is already here. He just started last month. We have never had a chief financial officer for the whole of health sciences. Gordon Crabtree is the CFO for the hospital and clinics, which is about a $1 billion enterprise. But all of health sciences, we're at almost two and a half billion now. So we've never had a CFO to take over the whole financial picture, to work with each of the financial administrators and to help make sure that we have the money to realize all the goals and all the strategies that we're aiming for. So David comes to us from Northwestern. He's phenomenal, phenomenally talented individual. So we're very, very lucky. Outside of the medical school, um, we had a retirement in the College of Nursing, and so we were able to recruit Trish Morton from the University of Maryland to be a new dean there. She's phenomenal. You know we have a new dental school, and I'll talk about that shortly, and so we had to recruit a new dental dean. Uh, Lynn Powell was our founding dean and got us started, and then we were able to recruit Rena D'Souza from Baylor. She is really the queen of academic dentistry. 
She's the president of the American Dental Research Association. She's just highly regarded. I got a ton of emails after that announcement uh, went out na nationally from people congratulating us on, on recruiting her. And then our dean of the College of Health has also stepped down, Jay Graves, and so we've appointed an interim dean, Robin Marcus, who is a physical therapist and also a very talented person. This year, we will have three um, chair searches. Three of our really wonderful chairs have decided that after more than a decade of serving as chair, they've sort of had enough with this administrative work. So uh, John Hoytle, who is just a phenomenal individual, has decided that at the end of this academic year, he'd like to step down from the chair of internal medicine. Of course, that's a huge, huge role for us to fill. Bill McMahon also wants to return to his research on autism. Um, in psychiatry, and similarly, Steve Stevens wants to return back to his work as a neurointerventional radiologist. And so all three of these individuals have contributed a lot to the organization, um, and they'll be hard acts to follow, but we will be starting those searches now. And so if you know of anybody good, let me know. So a couple of uh, up updates. So thank you so much for your support. This was a little video that we made with the students that we, um, you know, in this new day and age, we YouTubed it over to the governor's office, a video of our students thanking the governor for um, approving the funding for an additional $10 million a year to the School of Medicine every year to increase our class size from 82 to 102, and then, which we did this fall right now, and then in two more years, we're going up to 122. And we're just thrilled about that. There's a lot of projections about the physician shortage. Most of you told me last year that uh, we were 100 ever since you remember being here, or you know, we never exceeded that while the population has tripled in Utah. So I think it's about time we increase just a little bit. So we're really grateful. The community just helped us so much in lobbying the legislature for this additional funding. And so here's the new class. So the day after the, day after the governor signed the bill, because he signed it late spring, we sent out 20 more acceptance letters and said, welcome to the class. And so this, uh, I have to say, is just a phenomenal class, 102 students. Almost every county in Utah is represented. Almost every university or college in Utah is represented. According to Senate Bill 42, which was the piece of legislation that gave us the extra funding, 82% of our class has to be either a Utah resident, have graduated from a Utah high school, or have graduated from a Utah university. That's the new rule that we're, um, we, we have to abide by, which was no problem at all for us. So 84 out of the 102 students are Utah kids, as we call them. And then there are the eight from Idaho, and then there are 10 at large. So that's basically the composition of our class. Um, our new dean of admissions is a guy named Ben Chan, who reports up to now to Wayne Samuelson has just done a phenomenal job. He went all across the state, met with the pre-meds all over, and really influenced their decisions to come here. So this is kind of a bragging slide that he shared with me. This is where our students went to college um, before coming to medical school this fall. And of course, we have all the, the universities represented from Utah including BYU, Hawaii, and Provo, and the U, and USU, and UVU, and all the Utah schools, Weber State, Westminster. Um, on top of that, we have some of our top students, um, some of the top students from Harvard, Stanford, Dartmouth, um, UPenn, WashU, Wellesley. We really got some phenomenal students. And these students, um, what was so remarkable, is that um, they not only are terrific students, um, but they also decided to accept our offers at rates that we've never seen before. So here's our overall statistics. So we had 1,535 applications for our 100 slots. Actually, it was, they thought they were only competing for 80 slots at the time, but we ended up admitting 100. And this is a really interesting statistic for me. So we offered 90 slots, 90 acceptance letters to our Utah kids. And you'll see that 79 of those accepted our offer. That's an 88% hit rate. And you know that these students are applying to 20 or 30 medical schools. And the ones that get into the U frequently get to other great schools. Um, but 88% of them accepted our offer. And we typically don't go much above 50%. Um, usually our top students get stolen away by other places because they get scholarships and, and are other, otherwise tempted. So that's just phenomenal. That's, that's a really great sign that we are 
putting out a good message that we have a great medical school. And so here are some of the medical schools that, the, that our, our kids rejected in order to come to the U. And you'll see that there are some really great medical schools that they turned down in order to come to the U, including the University of Michigan, including Dartmouth, including Harvard, including um, Vanderbilt, University of Wisconsin, University of Washington, UW. So we're really, we're really, really pleased. And so I think that that's, that's just great news for the whole medical school, right? Yeah, we're really pleased about that. Another interesting statistic about this class is that we have 52 women and 50 men. That's <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> We've never really got much more than a third. Um, and you might say, well, Vivian, you kind of shifted the numbers. You must have admitted more women. But actually, we didn't admit any more women. We always admit about half and half. The problem is the women don't come. And that's why usually our classes are a third women and two thirds men. But this year, through this very persistent outreach, and um, the Dean of Admissions brought us to a bunch of the schools around. So I personally visited USU, SUU, BYU, and the U, and frequently brought a few physicians with me, some of whom were women. Um, you know, we really tried to say, this, is, this could be a great career for you. And so as a result, 80% of the women that we offered positions to accepted. And that's much, much higher than usual. So, so we're really excited about it. So. Now, what this leads to is a conversation a little bit about scholarships, because I know that many of you have supported us through scholarships. And just, just by the numbers, you know that if you're going to increase the class size by 50%, um, the scholarships have to go up because the state funding doesn't cover that. The state funding was simply just to cover the actual intrinsic costs of educating these additional students um, and building the, the resources and the anatomy labs and all those things to go with it. So here is our track record for scholarship uh, fundraising that Kristen Garang has been in charge of in recent years. And you'll see, uh, the graph kind of goes right to left for some reason. But anyway, so the latest year is here, 2012 to 13. And we, we raised about um, $884,000, which was about a 10% increase from the previous year. And we're really, really grateful for that. And what we're hoping, and this is just an outright ask of all of you, is that you will continue to support us because our, our students are really terrific. Um, but it does cost a lot to go to medical school and any way in which we can help them, they'll be encouraged to go into primary care and pursue the things that they love. So as I said, as we increase the number of students to 122, a 50% increase, we're going to require an increase in scholarships just to give them the same amount of money that they're getting now. And so we have a few, um, we have a few different options. Let's see here in this slide just to give you kind of a menu of the kinds of scholarship options and to share with you a new program that we have. So the most common gift I think that our alumni give, and we're very grateful for these, are these named scholarships. That's $5,000 per year with a five-year commitment. We have a new program which was developed as we were talking with the legislature about increasing the class size which had to do with how do we get more physicians into underserved communities. And so this is a new model. We've copied a bunch of other states. Lots of states in the middle of the country have this kind of plan also. It's a loan forgiveness model. So the idea is that we give them, it, it's not a scholarship outright, so we give them some money, but we say this is a loan. But after you finish your training, if you go and serve in a rural or underserved area and do primary care, then every year that you practice there will forgive one year of the loan. So you have to practice there for four years to forgive the four years of the loan. So it's intended to really encourage people. It doesn't force them. They can go into orthopedics and just pay the money back. That's okay. But it kind of encourages people. Well, it's not exactly okay, but I mean, you know what I mean by that. Um, but it encourages them to, to think about primary care and serving the rural and underserved area. So we're we're, this is brand new. We have a little bit of money to get this program started, um, and we would love to see this grow. And then finally, I just want a, a call out to the full tuition scholarship for those of you who can aspire to this kind of a gift. Uh, Robert Ballard was a very special graduate of this medical school and gave a planned gift. When he was alive, he supported this, and then he gave a planned gift um, to provide for a full ride for two students every year. And the way in which he structured it was to say, 
uh, when we rank those students, when we admit them, let's give the full ride to the top two students and make sure that they're not stolen by all these other medical schools that also go after our top two students. Let's make sure that they stay here because we want our best and brightest to stay here in Utah. And so that's how he configured his gift. And I would love to see, my goal, my dream, is to have our top 10, to be able to do 10 full rides so that we always know, we always get our top 10 students here in Utah to stay at the University of Utah. It's pretty stiff competition for those top students. I don't know if you realize, but the Cleveland Clinic, even though they're small, they only have 30 some students, they're all on a full ride. So we, we are against some places. Baylor has a bunch of these. So we want to be able to, to keep our students here and not, not be stolen away by those other schools. And most of these students, they want to stay here. So, okay, let me just transition a little bit to what we're doing in terms of our overarching strategy and the themes we're talking about here at the U across all of health sciences, not just in the School of Medicine. And our goal is to lead the transformation of academic medicine. And by that, we are specifically saying that for our patients and payers, best outcomes, lowest cost, greatest satisfaction. Very important to me, our faculty and staff to create a really productive and satisfying work environment with great compensation and benefits. And then, of course, the reason why we're all here for our students and trainees, the opportunity to participate in a fully engaged and respectful learning environment that equips them for the changing world. That's very important to us. And then, of course, more broadly for the community and population, the work we do in research that translates into better health for the state and nation, as well as our community service work. So these are kind of the goals that we've articulated for health sciences as a whole. And I do have a few more bragging slides because I figure we all like to brag about our alma mater. So hopefully these will be of interest to you. So you know that in 2010, the University of Utah was ranked, compared to all the academic medical centers in the country, number one in quality, and that's beating out the Stanfords and the Hopkins and the Mayos. And we just heard, although it's not public knowledge yet, that we are in the top 10 for the fourth year in a row. And that puts us in the company with only Mayo and Beaumont Hospital in Detroit. There's only three of us that have been the top 10 for four years in a row out of all 110, 115 medical schools. So how's that? That's pretty good, right? Our, our hospital and clinics leadership have just been phenomenal, so I have to give them a huge amount of credit for that. And then there are a number of other awards that are coming in, like US News and World Report. Just this year, Consumer Reports, which we didn't expect to be ranked at all. I mean, we didn't know anything about this ranking system. They ranked about 450 um, hospitals. Any hospital that had any students or trainees, including the Intermountain System, and we were number 10 in the country out of 450 hospitals. So we're feeling, it's, we're, not, we're not satisfied. Of course, we're always trying to improve quality, but at least we're getting some recognition, so we're happy about that. So how are we thinking about healthcare reform and improving quality? I just have, I think, maybe two or three slides just giving you a flavor about how we're thinking about healthcare reform. So one of the areas that we're really focused on is costs which is not only about saving money, but improving quality. Lots of studies have shown that we actually, by overspending, in many cases, reduce the quality by overspending. And I think in the beginning, nobody felt that that would be true, but now I think everybody understands it's really true. When we overspend, we do too many procedures. Like in my case, we do too many scans, we find incidental findings, and then all these things happen that really don't improve health. And so. One of the things that was recommended in this Institute of Medicine report, this came from an IOM report uh, from about a year and a half ago, was why don't we look to other industries like uh, manufacturing, like the airplane industry, you know, airline safety. Look at other industries to say how can we improve quality, identify inefficiencies, and remove waste. And a lot of that is embodied in this whole management approach called lean. And lean is about understanding where you have a lot of variability system and driving down your cost. So I only have one slide on this initiative, but I want to explain this to you really well because I think this is one of the most interesting and important things we're doing here at the U. 
even though we haven't made it beautiful, you guys are the, one of the first groups to see this. So it hasn't been beautified by our PR people yet, okay? But it will be, it will be. But you're seeing it in the raw, okay? So <laughs> you're getting your early access here to this information. So we are calling it value-driven outcomes. And the premise behind this is that in healthcare, which is 18% of the economy, we don't really know the costs of providing care. I'm not talking about charges, like what we put on the bills. I'm saying, what does it really cost us to see a patient, to give a vaccination, to do an MRI scan? What does it cost us, right? Do you, do you know, those of you who practice, do you have any idea what it actually cost you to have a patient come into your office for 30 minutes and then leave? Any idea? Know what it cost you to go into the OR and do a, do a surgical procedure? No idea, right? So this is 18% of our economy. Imagine any other business. Imagine walking into a Ford manufacturing plant or um, an Albertsons grocery store, and no one knows what it actually costs for a can of beans or for a windshield wiper in a car ma manufacturing plant. Like, nobody knows. The customer doesn't know. The manager of the shop doesn't know. Nobody knows the actual cost. So then we arbitrarily put some price tags on everything, which now, of course, are in the press. Everybody's all up in arms about how crazy our bills are. But our bills are actually kind of made up numbers. They're numbers that we come up with through negotiating with insurance companies. Whatever they'll pay us, that's kind of what our charge is, right? So that is the background. And there's been some, some folks in the broader uh, health services research field have realized this. So one of the most important people who's realized this is a guy named Michael Porter, who's a professor at the Harvard Business School. And if anybody's done business training, he's the father of strategy. He's the guy who's written all the textbooks on strategy at Harvard Business School. And he's been writing about it a lot. In fact, he had just a piece, if you're interested in this, um, last month in the Harvard Business Review. It's a great piece on what's wrong with healthcare. And he says, you know, the dirty little secret of healthcare is nobody knows the costs. So how can we bring the cost down if we don't know our costs, right? So we um, started on this project about a year and a half ago to know our costs at the University of Utah, to break down every component from what does it cost for every minute in the OR for us, every minute in the MRI scanner, our pharmacy costs, our lab costs, our unit of physician time costs. It, you can see it's kind of a big deal. It's about 135 million lines of code of programming code to do this work. Um, but we sequestered this whole group of nerds, these really smart people, <laughs> into um, a, a place in Research Park for six months. And they created this program. And it's, this is the raw program. What it does for you is it enables you to look at the last fiscal year, the whole year, all the patients that came into the University of Utah system. So we have more than a million patient visits a year. And you can break it down by departments. This is orthopedic surgery. You can do it by DRGs or ICD codes or whatever you want to do. But in this case, we did hip replacements. So these are all the hip replacements done in the system for the last year. And this is, in, ca in this case, by provider. So these are all different orthopedic surgeons. And here you see the average cost. Not what we charged, but what it actually cost us to do this procedure. And can you see that it varies from about, there's about 100% difference between the most expensive and the least expensive provider. Now you may say, in this day and age, who cares, right? If this guy, if it costs 18,000, he can probably charge you know, twice that and we still make a margin. And this guy can charge, you know, we can pay. But increasingly we're getting, con we're, we're in a capitated market. Bundled payments, capitated markets, we're only gonna get paid one fixed amount for doing a hip. So we are gonna care how much these cost. So when you look at these costs, you see, first of all, that there's about 100% difference between the lowest and the highest cost provider. And then, because we've calculated all the different components, you can see what's driving the cost. Each of these colors is a different piece. And the biggest driver is the prosthesis itself. So this big orange block. So some folks are using a prosthesis that costs three times as much as another one. And right now, we're reimbursed for it. So we don't really care too much about that right now. I mean, we care from a system-wide perspective. but. It doesn't really impact our finances, but when we get paid just $1 amount, we really care a lot. Another screen of this shows you their outcomes. So it shows you that this surgeon has the exact same outcomes as this surgeon. Okay, so that's kind of an important factor as well. Then you can also notice all these other lines and how variable they are. So some of them are length of stay, 
Some of them are labs. The green is OR time, pharmacy, radiology. Some people don't use any radiology. Some people use some radiology. You see how much variability there is? The take home message of this is the only constant is the variability. So we're using this kind of data now to drive system-wide change across the organization, to put all the orthopedists are in the room, we show them these data, we show them their outcomes data, and then we start to say, you know what, wouldn't it be better if we could come up with some consistent care pathways where we have some protocols for how we take care of our patients. And this will really improve quality because it will reduce errors. Right now, when you go to the floor and you ask the nurses, you know, which doc likes which drug on which day or which DVT prophylaxis or which whatever, everybody's got their own little protocol and they all get confused, right? So we make a lot more mistakes and it's a lot harder to provide care. So this tool, even though it's a tool and it may not be super, super sexy, is, um, represents, I think, we are the first in the country to do anything like this. The UHC folks of all the academic hospitals have actually sent teams out to study what we're doing now. And we're sharing it. We, we want other people to learn how to do it too. But this is going to be absolutely critical for us in this era of healthcare reform. Have, have any of you who are, who are practicing, have you experienced capitated or bundled payments yet? Some of you, right? So I don't know if you know it, but for those of you in Utah, as of January 1, 2013, so just this past January, all of Medicaid is now capitated. So Medicaid, we're paid per patient per month or per member per month to, to take care of these patients. And if they come in and they get this hip replacement, we are out a lot of money. We are out a lot of money, and that's 10% of our volume right now, 10% of our adults, 30% of our kids. So as that changes, these kinds of tools are going to be absolutely critical for all health systems to really navigate healthcare reform. So we've used this kind of tool. Uh, oh, we got a, a few awards for it. Uh, we've used this tool now to implement a number of changes across the organization. And in all of them, we're tracking um, the impact on quality, the impact on access, and the impact on costs. So some of these, for example, are access. So by reducing the variability or adjusting how we're doing things, we can get patients in faster. In some cases, it's just simply about um, saving money from unnecessary lab tests and so on. So this is a system-wide effort now, and we're doing a lot of, a lot of training, and, uh, and I'm personally really, really excited about it. So what we're trying to do is to achieve this, what we call a virtuous cycle of reform, implement some things like these new care pathways and these tools, which will benefit our clinical enterprise, but at the same time spin off some good research projects, right? Some really good research um, to show that by changing the way we practice, we can have better outcomes and lower costs and provide an environment for our trainees that's really equipping them for the future. And that to me is, is, is absolutely essential. So that's our goal. Um, some of our strategies here are just summarized here, our overall strategy. We're really, as an academic medical center, we're feeling the squeeze from all directions. Um, you know, the government's shut down. The NIH was already cut, but now they're not even issuing any checks. It's like, it's to make matters worse. Um, we don't expect um, any more money in our clinical enterprise, only less. Education has never been well-funded, even though we got more money from the state, it's still way underfunded. So how are we approaching this? Well, we have a few strategies for increasing revenue and just improving our yield. One is we're investing a lot in faculty development. We're investing a lot in helping our faculty get grants, in doing um, programs to help them be better educators, all kinds of faculty. We're making a lot of faculty development invest investments. Philanthropy's got to be a big driver for us. That's why Jay's imminent arrival as the head of development is so important. And then I think where we can really see some opportunity is through leveraging all the innovation and the intellectual property that's coming out of this place and generating more licensing revenue. So I came from an organization, NYU, happened to be and still is now number one in the country in licensing revenue. Um, we were making about $160 million off of our IP, just in the medical school alone. So there's a lot of opportunity here, a lot of innovation. We just need to kind of just package it and get it moving over a little bit better. So you know the University of Utah, number one in startups in the nation for two years. 
Um, there's a lot of possibilities. And so we created last year, under the leadership of Dr. John Langell, a new Center for Medical Innovation that I think is just really, really exciting. It's a partnership between the Health Sciences, the College of Engineering, and the School of Business, plus Tech Ventures, of course. And it puts all these really bright minds together to think about innovation. And let me show you some of the components of what this center is about. So there's three little programs here that I'm just going to highlight briefly that all sort of fit together. One is the Utah Biodesign Program. So the Biodesign Program, it's an undergraduate program. It takes undergraduate engineering students, partners them up with clinicians, and then has them innovate and create new devices. So I don't know if any of you have heard this story, but one of the best stories out of this program was two young women when they were freshmen in this program. So they're 18-year-old, two women. I try not to call them girls, but they're two young women. And they are these engineering students, and they're in this program, and they come into the operating room, and they've got their masks on, and they're really nervous, and they're sort of standing at the back, and they're observing and trying to think of how they can use their engineering tools to innovate. And as they're observing, it's an abdominal case, it's a surgical case in the abdomen, and you know, you got the retractors and the surgeon, you got the lights overhead, but of course, you know, the surgeon, how many of you are surgeons? A few of you are surgeons? Okay, so you know, your head's in the way, so you have your little headlamp on, and so they're kind of getting blinded by the headlamp whenever he looks up, and they're thinking, this seems kind of barbaric. <laughs> and so their idea was to put uh, LED lights on the retractors. They said, why not put LED lights on the retractors? It shines right in the field. It's an inter interesting engineering project because you need power to it. It needs to be sterilizable. You know, it needs to be reusable. Uh, so there is some engineering aspect to it. And so starting as freshmen, they came up with an idea. It's created a company. They submitted this project. They were in the top five winners of a national competition for innovation for undergraduates. And that's the kind of idea. You know, those are the kinds of things that I think we can do here. Um, here's another example of what students did. So John Fang is a gastroenterologist here at the U. He does all the scopes. And he has had this idea for years about why do we put NG tubes down blind, blindly, you know, and then get the x-rays. Why not just use a scope, help use the scope to put it down, and then just pull the scope out. And he's had this idea for years. He's not an engineer. He doesn't have any background in this at all. And so this team of undergraduates, supervised by a faculty member, helped developed the prototype for him. And that's now called Veritrack. They have a company. They're in, phase, they're in trials. And um, it's another example of how these partnerships can be so great. So that's the biodesign program. The second program I want to tell you about, which is uh, super exciting also, is called Bench to Bedside. Have you heard about the Bench to Bedside? Any of you heard about this? OK. This is a great student-started competition. Okay, the, the students who started this were undergraduate um, majors in engineering here at the U, and then they came to the U for medical school. And they said, wow, there's so many opportunities here. What if we created teams and made a competition? And every team has a health sciences student, at least one, an engineering student, because that was their roots, and then the brilliant step they had was to put an MBA student, at least one MBA student on every team. Right, the MBA student, grounded, is this really practical? Is this really scalable? Do you really have a business plan? And then this year, they added on law students. So we actually have two law students who are doing patent searches for us out of the law school. So we're now in our, we're just starting our fourth year of this device competition. Typically, we've had 60, 80 students um, participating. Last year, out of those 80 that participated, there were 14 provisional patents filed. That's pretty good. And every year, one or two teams actually go off and do a startup, one or two. So this year, we've set a record. We have more than 200 students participating this year because we opened it up. It used to be just the medical school, but now it's pharmacy, nursing, everybody in the health sciences. Um, and we opened it up more on, on the law side and other students. So we have more than 40 teams put together this year. And we've expanded it, and I'll talk about this more. We now have two tracks in the competition. One is devices, and the other is video games and apps. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the video games and apps in a second, because I think that's really excited. So again, this is a student-initiated. Student it's all word of mouth. Um, I was visiting with my counterpart at UCSF um, last year, and I was telling her about this program. And she said, I am so envious. I said, why? She said, well, we got a gift for a million and a half dollars to do the same thing. 
to partner between UCSF, pretty good medical school, and UC Berkeley, pretty good engineering school. And we wanted to do the same thing. And I said, wow, that's incredible. That's 10 times our budget, right? We have 150,000, we think that's pretty good. And she said, right, the problem is I had nine students sign up, eight from the medical school, one from engineering. I said, well, we could use that money. <laughs> we could collaborate, no problem. So we're really lucky. It's student driven and there's just so much energy behind it. Um, this is an example of one of the innovations from last year, a new cervical tenaculum, right? So when medical students see the cervical tenaculum, they sort of think that's barbaric too. So they have a, a new idea about that. And there's a great event, if any of you are in town in April, uh, where we have all the students with their prototypes and their big boards and they're all pitching, doing their elevator pitches on their ideas. It's judged by venture capital folks in the community and so many of their ideas are actually funded or they receive our prize money. So that's fabulous. And then the last component I wanted to share with you, which is very brief, is called the BioInnovate program. And this is a master's degree offered from bioengineering that's run by, in collaboration. And it's to take people like us who may not have an engineering background, physicians or pharmacists or other people who have a really great idea and they want to know, how do I take this great idea into making a prototype, into filing for the IP, market analysis, business plan, all the way to getting insurance approval. And so it's a one year course on entrepreneurship, basically, on, for, for the professionals. And we've been uh, recruiting junior faculty, and every year we have a couple of faculty where as part of their recruitment into OBGYN, into anesthesia, into the ER, is we will sponsor them to do this because they have some crazy idea in their head and they want to do this, and we're the only place that will offer this, and so we can, we can really uh, successfully recruit. So those are three components. And now I just want to elaborate a little bit more on the video gaming piece of this. So the video gaming um, here, how many of you, have you, do you even know we have a video gaming program at the University of Utah? A few of you know, oh, you guys do know, that's good. Those of you who don't know, it's a combined program between media arts and computer science. It, it doesn't have anything to do with health sciences. It was something started on main campus. Um, and the, they have, created a bunch of video games that have actually gone to market. Last year they were ranked number three in the country as a graduate program behind MIT and USC. This year they're ranked number one in the country, which is really great for us. And so we're really interested in partnering with them to develop video games and apps for health. And, uh, and you may say, well, video games, that seems so childish. Why would we want to do that? Actually, there are just enormous opportunities here. And I'll just give you an example of four projects that are already happening now, that already have prototypes. Some of them already have venture capital funding. So pediatric patients with cancer. There's a video game. The kids have these little things that they wave around. On the screen, there are all these cancer cells, and these kids, they're crabby cancer cells, <laughs> and they take their little hammers, which are like Wii devices, and they kind of try to kill all the cancer cells. And so that's an empowerment kind of software tool, helping, have, helping these kids visualize what their cancers are about, helping them kind of cope with it. They can play the game with their friends and their siblings. Um, there's some studies that show that if, you, if the kids feel empowered over their cancers, they actually do a little bit better in coping with it. There's a whole category of spinal cord injury. There's a video game where these folks are, who have spinal cord injuries are, are walking and they have a farm and there's a field and all these animals and things are coming to attack their vegetables and they have to kind of whack them away. And in the course of doing it as part of rehab, but it also, these devices measure the force that they can do and measure their range of motion. So it's actually a data collection system as well. Life skills for children with autism, that's a medical, that's a bench to bedside product from last year. So those are the medical students who came up with this video game. Um, they think that you can create video games. You know, autistic kids frequently are very interested in video games and they've created the prototype for one, which is to teach kids to wash their hands. So the video game, it's a very simple prototype. Um, we only give them $500 each team to, to do this, so they don't have a lot of money to work with. But their prototype has a TV screen or the computer screen with a bunch of colored bubbles, and there's a camera interface, and you just have to rub your hands. And when you rub your hands, the bubbles pop. 
And so you're just motivated to just keep rubbing your hands for as long as it takes to wash your hands. That, that's their prototype. So they have some venture, they just got some venture capital money, about $50,000 to get that started. Another one was tracking dietary intake in glycogen storage diseases. This was another bench to bedside student project, just simply um, a social media type thing where you track how much of whatever you ate and you get so many points if you eat this and don't eat that. And then you compare with your other GSD friends who might be local or might be across the country. And it's kind of like a game to try to get kids to comply with their dietary recommendations. So just to give you a flavor of the range of opportunity there, do you get a sense of kind of how interesting it could be? I think this is a field where 10 years from now, we'll look back and we'll think, wow, I never thought you could do that. You know what I mean? Because it's so, so disruptive, so innovative. So we're doing a lot of other um, games that are on the horizon, including surgical training and simulation games, um, patient management games, diabetes games, even a new game on air quality. So this is something that we're rolling out in partnership with that video gaming team. They're now committed to devoting the majority of their work to, to medicine and health. And so we're, we're really excited. And each of these has the benefit of helping people, which is our top priority, but also potentially generating revenue which is also a priority for us. So that's kind of a win-win for us. Okay, now let me just finish what I wanna say. I'm gonna skip this for a minute and talk about um, the campus for the last few minutes. So here's another announcement. In have you guys ever heard of this website? I've never heard of it, bestmedicaldegrees.com. Never heard of it, right? But anyway, 40, they rank the 40 most beautiful medical schools in the U.S. Okay, I guess that's a factor at best medical degrees. And look, the University of Utah, number 14, another bragging point for us. Except this isn't the School of Medicine, <laughs> it's the hospital. <laughs> so just a little detail. <laughs> but they did call out our beautiful natural you know, setting and the gorgeous landscape that we're in. Um, and what they really pointed out is uh, that we have an opportunity, a unique opportunity now, and I'm emphasizing the word opportunity that comes along only every 40 or 50 years, and I seem to have hit the timing just right on this, um, which is to make our campus, and here's the School of Medicine building, right here, all of you know the building here, which is unfortunately, as I'm gonna talk about, exceeded its use by date and to try to convert it and to create a whole new campus. And the reason for this, you might say, well, she's kind of crazy. Why would she want to, um, why would she want to take down this building? And I'll tell you, I don't want to take down this building. So this building, we've been talking about this building for a long time because it's not seismically sound. Um, but Loris Betts, my predecessor, he left me kind of a parting gift. <laughs> Before he left, he called in the architects to come and assess the building again. And they said, um, yes, it's still seismically unsound, but that's really the least of your problems. The problem with this building is the basic infrastructure is falling apart. The water, the power, the HVAC, all the infrastructure is falling apart. And we know that, it's, it's leaking all the time. We have to repair. And, and they said, you will get out at the most five years of life from this building and every year that you keep it up, you will be pouring millions in just to keep it going. So they, they already had warned us years ago that we should think about taking it down, but Loris, he got his timing right. He exited just in time uh, <laughs> and handed this over to me. So we are going to have to take the School of Medicine down. And uh, it is costing us a lot of money just to repair it now. Every year we're having to put more and more money into it. And so this is our big challenge that you will hear more about. Again, this is the first time I'm really talking about this publicly. So you're the first ones to hear this news, but we are gonna have to take this building down. And we are working on it internally. And what I wanna do is just share with you um, how we're trying to convert, make lemonade out of this lemon, which is to, to take the opportunity in taking down this building to say, well, what would we really like the campus to look like? How would we, how can we view this as a campus redesign opportunity? Because this is a 600,000 square foot building right in the heart of the campus, right? So when you take it down, you do have the chance to redefine it. And we noticed when we brought in the architects, they said, you know, you've built a ton of buildings here. Loris built a lot of buildings here. And, but they haven't created a campus feel. 
And so that's what we're trying to think about too, is how to create a campus, how to create more interactions um, in the course of this project. So here's what our plan is gonna be over the next five years or so. Um, we have to do some renovations. Uh, we are going to build a new wing of Huntsman. Um, John Huntsman Sr. Is, is just driving this with, with great gusto and we're absolutely thrilled about that because we are bursting at the seams. So there will be a new wing of Huntsman for research. Um, and then some other renovations. We have to build a hospital services building because there are some critical services for the hospital that are right now housed in the School of Medicine building. So we need to relocate them um, in close proximity. And then we have to take down the 521 building. And we have set a target for ourselves. That building is going to be emptied by the end of December 2015. That's just about two years from now. Remember, it's 600,000 square feet. So it will take one year to take down that building. One year, because think how many trucks are gonna have to go from here out here mm -hmm. to take down 600,000 square feet of bricks and mortar. That's a lot of building. Um, and then we have the chance to build a new building. And when we build the new building, the architects are actually planning to create a ring road here, kind of a circular road that will go all the way around the academic core of the campus. And that can be, at that point, there can be hopefully electric shuttle buses and things like that, so it can keep, tra keep car traffic out of this area, but kind of connect the whole campus together and will enable us to have a big green space here, which we think will be really, really nice. Um, uh, so let me just show you kind of, we don't have mock-ups yet of the building. This is just a very preliminary kind of placeholder, but so here would be, there will be a building here, and then this will be part of that circular road, and of course the back part is the hospital, so it'd be connected to the hospital, and we're planning to call this the MED building, Medical Education and Discovery, so the MED building, Med Medical Education and Discovery, and what you can't see here is, because 521 is so huge and goes down deeply, there's a two-story deep crater that'll be left when we take out 521. And we had the option of creating the world's largest swimming pool <laughs> or an innovation zone. So we decided for the innovation zone. So under here is gonna be an innovation zone and they're planning actually in a kind of a, you know at the Louvre they have that glass pyramid kind of thing? So the idea is to have some glassy thing here that will connect into the underground in a big innovation zone. And you know, these architects, they're still sort of playing and messing around with that idea. But we're trying to, trying to convert this into an opportunity. And so we're looking forward over the next year or two to starting to plan out what this new building will look like and get some excitement around it. But you can see that this is a big deal for us. It's a big, big project and, um, and we hope that everyone can help us with it. Our goal when we design this building, and again, this is not the building. This is not what the building's gonna look like. The architects just sort of plunked something in there for now. But our goal is to create a really iconic medical school building. You know, a building that's just gonna be really classy and just really beautiful. Um, the business school did a great job when they built a new business school building. It, it's sort of really reflective of their aspirations to be a really great business school. And we have aspirations to be an even better medical school than we already are. And to have a really nice home that reflects that aspiration, I think will be really important for the campus. So look forward to filling you in on that more in the future. So with that, I'll close with my last slide here just to say that we are always looking forward to communicating with everybody here in the room. Um, we have tried to increase the kinds of communication venues and opportunities. Last year we had an Algorithms for Innovation uh, report and in the next couple of weeks you'll be getting in the mail the new Algorithms for Innovation annual report so I hope you'll enjoy that and give us some feedback. Uh, we have some great websites now. Our website at the main campus is the Health Feed website. Um, then we have, oh, I have my own blog site and of course we have an Algorithms website where we put all of this material and more online. So we have lots of different ways to communicate electronically and of course um, you can always email me if you have any. Oops, sorry, I have a little glitch. 
And so, well, we're making a lot of progress. We're not quite there yet, but hopefully in working together with all of you, we can, we can get there. So with that, I think that's my last slide. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks.